Hi, everyone. Um, welcome again. Thank you so much for coming. I'm ju um, just going to do some housekeeping stuff before we get started and as people are coming in. Um, just a few housekeeping matters. Um, if you've been on Zoom before, you know that background noise can make it hard to hear. So um, I'm asking you to stay muted unless you want to speak and, and to unmute yourself. Um, you go to the cursor at the look, take the cursor to the lower left of the screen and you click on the microphone, but you can do that after the presentation. Um, there are a couple ways to view um, the presentation. There's speaker view and there's gallery view. If, uh, speaker view is probably preferred if you want to focus on um, William Taylor, um, but you can see everyone if you hit gallery view, that's in the top right of your screen. Um, and if you'd like, there are a lot of us tonight. So ideally you would type your message in the chat box. So if you go down to the bottom of the screen, it says chat and you can, um, you can type a question in there. And I think that'll be easier because there are so many of us, it's gonna be hard to have people speaking. But if you can't, if you can't find the chat box, then feel free to, to raise your hand, which you do by hitting participants and then uh, raise hand. Um, and that's on the bottom and then the right. Um, we're recording if that's uh, we'll put this on YouTube and within the week or so. Um, if you don't want to be on the recording, you can just turn off your camera, your video. And I think that's everything except just to introduce our speaker, um, William Francis Taylor, who is uh, of the Hamptons Observatory, who's a senior educator and a NASA solar system ambassador um, since 2014. And William is going to explain what a NASA Solar System Ambassador is. Um, and I just want to thank you again, William, um, for doing this. And thank Donna McCormick of the Observatory. You both have done a tremendous amount of work and we really appreciate it. So with that, I will say thank you and go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Jocelyn. And thank you to everyone else from the, the Shelter Island Public Library for, for hosting us tonight. Um, this is, uh, I think, my second or third time I've done an event with the Shelter, Shelter Island Library. The last were in person, like we used to do things. Now we're doing things online, so it's a little bit different. Uh, one advantage is that we, we can do it rain or shine, even if it's, the weather's not good. But today, at least where I am in East Hampton, we have beautiful weather. So I encourage everyone to go outside and, and look at the night sky after we're done with this. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, my positions, um, so the NASA Solar System Ambassador Program is a, is a volunteer uh, organization that's run by NASA through the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in order to encourage science education in the country, in order to uh, just make people aware of things that are interesting that are happening in space. Um, uh, in some cases, that might be a, a new uh, uh, rocket, like the one that's going to Mars in a few days. Um, in another case, it might be something really interesting in the night sky, like Comet Neowise, which I'll talk about in a little bit. In terms of the Hamptons Observatory, we're a, a local nonprofit organization. Uh, which is also committed to fostering science education uh, on the east end of Long Island. Um, and for that end, we've uh, been building an observatory um, that's at the campus of the Ross School right now um, that will, will, will be open one day uh, to uh, people to come in person again. We hope to do in-person events again once the pandemic uh, is over. But um, in the meantime, we're, we're going to try to do online events like this and try to uh, reach out to people in other ways in you know, the night sky. Um, so I'm just going to talk uh, for about um, a half hour or so about some things that I think are interesting going on in the night sky. And then I'm going to be really interested in taking your questions. Uh, anyone in the audience who wants to pose a question, um, you can either leave it as a chat or afterwards you can raise your hand and then um, I'll be able to hopefully guide you through anything you want to see. I have a planetarium program with me um, and I can use the planetarium program. Um, basically uh, show you anything in the night sky that you want to see apart from the comment. So I'll start with the comment. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Um, so, okay. So, um, let's start from the very beginning. Okay, so uh, the main theme of this night is summertime stargazing. It's, not, it's very general. I, I gave a similar talk about a month ago, but fortunately there's so much to see in the night sky that we never really run out of topics. Uh, one thing that's happened uh, since uh, my last talk, which was in June, is this incredible uh, new comet that we got to see, which is called Comet Neowise. Um, some of you may have seen it, some of you may, uh, may not. Um, so Comet Neowise uh, was discovered in March by a satellite called Neowise that orbits 
the sun, taking pictures of the sun, and sometimes it discovers a new comet. Um, for, for us who live in the northern hemisphere of the Earth, this is the brightest comet that we've seen since 1997. And some of you might remember the comet hale that came that year, which is really bright and spectacular. Uh, Neowise is not as bright as hale not, not not really very close to as bright as hale or the other great comet in the 1990s, which is Yakutake. Uh, but Neowise is still a beautiful comet. It's a very classical comet with a long, beautiful tail. Um, and so I'm just gonna share some pictures of it. Um, here is an amazing picture by Damien Peach, who's a wonderful astrophotographer. And you can see uh, two things about the comet. Uh, one is that it has two tails. Uh, one is, is the white one going off to the right here, and the one is this long, straight blue one. Uh, both of these are, are not easy to see with the naked eye, but uh, through long-term photographs, you, you can see them. Um, and so basically what they are is that this tail, the, the white one, is a tail of dust. So as the comet travels to the solar system, it gets heated up by the sun, um, and it starts shooting off an enormous amount of dust and ice and other kinds of particles into the surrounding uh, vacuum. Uh, but there's another kind of tail, which is called the ion tail. So um, if you're not familiar, an ion is basically a particle of gas, which has a charge to it. So it's either positive or negative charge. And because the sun works as a kind of uh, magnet in some ways, but also has an enormously powerful uh, solar wind coming out of it, of the charged particles, that tends to push the gas away really, really fast in the stream. So we can see both of those uh, through long-term phot uh, photography. Um, I've seen a lot of these beautiful pictures of Comet Neowise, and I'm not uh, I'm not going to disparage any of them because they're beautiful, but I, I do want to keep, make people aware that it, what you see in these photographs is not necessarily what you see with the naked eye. Um, to me, uh, this photograph, which is um, from Germany, from the castle of Neuschwanstein in Bavaria, is a little more accurate about what I actually saw. The comet is not particularly bright. It is very beautiful, but a lot of the stunning details that we see in um, uh, astrophotographs represent things that you need to have really long-term exposures, really large optical instruments like a camera or a telescope to see. And so sometimes it can be a little bit disappointing when we go out and we, we look for things. I know a lot of my friends have gone out to try to see NeoWise and not really been uh, successful at it. Um, we're we're going to have a few more days left with this comment, we hope, until the, the moon comes and totally obliterates our point of view. So maybe tonight would be a good night to try to find it. I'll give you some pointers about where it is in a bit. Um, here's a photo of, of the comet from very close up, uh, again from Damien Peach. And basically what a comet is, is it's a, a ball of, uh, of ice and rock, in this case about five miles across or even less than that. Um, and it comes from the really, really far outer reaches of the solar system. Uh, often when it comes to the sun, it, it hasn't been anywhere near the sun in thousands of years, so it starts to melt really rapidly. And that's what we see here, cascading uh, clouds of gas coming out of that comet. Uh, we don't have any close-up pictures of comet Neowise, so I'm going to substitute another comet that we do have a close-up picture for. Uh, this is a comet with the name 67P Shoyumov Gerasimenko, which is a little hard to pronounce because uh, there are two Russian astronomers who discovered it. Uh, but this comet uh, was visited by a space probe uh, about five to 10 years ago called Rosetta. Um, and you can see how, how cool it is up close. It looks to me uh, like an animal that lives in the Amazon called the capybara. Uh, some people thought it looked like a rubber ducky uh, when it was first discovered. It's unusual. It, it doesn't look like what we thought comets looked like, but a lot of comets have these kind of funky features when you get really up close. Uh, one thing I'll draw your attention to is that there's lots of gas and dust and other things just coming out of this comet. And uh, when uh, Rosetta got very close to the comet, it saw what the origin was. The comet is covered with little geysers, things like geysers that constantly shoot this uh, material out of space. Uh, here's a, a wonderful picture from very, very close up of what that comet, uh, Gerasimenko, looked like. Uh, and we can expect that comet Neowise probably looks kind of similar when we got really close to it. Um, here is a little guide to where you might be able to see Neowise in the next couple of days. So today is the 27th. Uh, one thing that's made it really helpful is it's directly underneath the Big Dipper, um, which makes the constellation most of us know. Um, it's moving towards this direction as the days go by. Uh, one thing that we are struggling with though is that the comet is close to the horizon. So the best time to go see it is right after, maybe an hour after sunset once it starts to get dark enough to see. Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's uh, competing with a lot of other sources of light. It's competing with the moon right now, so the moon starts to get brighter and brighter, and it's competing with something more nefarious, much more nefarious, called light pollution, which is just the light that comes from, in our case, when we look towards the north, even if we live on the east end of Long Island, we see a lot of light pollution coming from cities in that direction. Um, but it's still a beautiful thing to see. I, I'd encourage you, if, if you can, try to see it tonight. 
uh, because I can't guarantee you'll be able to see it again. As it moves farther away from the sun, it's going to become dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Um, so let's try to explain a little bit about uh, where this comet is. Um, here is a picture of our Earth. Um, obviously, uh, the Earth is probably the biggest thing that most of us can wrap our minds around because we can see the other end of it if we if we have the opportunity. Um, but it's it's rather a small thing in the scale of the universe. To try to explain how far away things are in space, I could tell you how far away they are in kilometers and miles. But I find that uh, most people don't understand what a million kilometers is. I don't understand what it means. I don't understand it viscerally. Um, so I'm going to use an analogy. So we're going to take this big earth that we live on that has every single human being that we ever knew, every story that we've ever heard, and we're going to shrink it down to a golf ball, <laughs> a common object that most of us are familiar with. And we're going to try to uh, use a, uh, the ratio between the golf ball and uh, the golf course to explain how big the orbit of the Earth is. So the uh, orbit of uh, the, the Earth around the sun is about 12,000 times uh, the diameter of the Earth. It's, it's really enormous. Uh, so if you imagine a, a golf ball, which is usually one and a half inches or so across, uh, we'd have to go 20,000 inches, <laughs> which is uh, about 500 meters or I, don't, I forget how many feet, um, pretty far to get towards where the sun would be. So the sun would be maybe this grove of trees right here. Um, so this is a golf course on Shelter Island, but you can use any golf course. Um, they're usually about the same size, and it kind of gives you a sense of, of um, how small. If you, if you hold a golf, court, golf ball in your hand and you look at across this great big golf course, you can kind of sense the ratio of how small this little planet that we live on is traveling through this enormous space. And it, you also gain an appreciation for how fast our world is traveling since uh, we're traveling through this enormous territory. Imagine the golf ball moving through this space, and that's our entire planet. We're moving through it in just a year, uh, it takes us to get through it. The other planets I'm gonna use in the same map, um, just using the idea of ratio. So here is the orbit of the Earth, the third one out. The others closer to the sun are Venus and Mercury, and a little bit further out is Mars. So even if you've uh, shrunk the Earth so much that it's just the size of a golf ball, to, uh, to really get the sense of how big the solar system is, it, it takes up most of um, a town, in this case, in the case of Shelter Island. Um, uh, if we want to uh, include some of the outer planets, like Jupiter and Saturn, we have to go really far out, go to other towns on the North Fork. Um, <laughs> so here is the orbit of Jupiter. Again, about 10 times the size of Earth, but much farther away from the Sun. Here's the orbit of Saturn, two other planets we'll see today. There are other planets out there that go even farther away. Um, but let's take a look at the comet. Here is where the comet came through our solar system uh, two months ago. So this right now is in June. And we can see that the comet is this purple thing. Earth is the blue thing over here. The comet came pretty close to the sun, but it didn't ever get particularly close to the Earth. Uh, these lines that you're seeing underneath the comet represent the fact that most of the planets are in a flat plane, very, very flat plane that we call the ecliptic plane. But the comet is kind of a wild card. It, it travels much to the south and north of that plane. Um, so uh, here's the comet on its way out of the solar system. Now, how far is it going to travel? So I made the same analogy. Uh, so if uh, the solar system were about the size of Shelter Island, this is how far the comet is traveling. So here is uh, us on Shelter Island. The comet travels all the way out here, many, uh, all, about to Montpelier, Vermont on the same scale. Um, so uh, it, it travels hundreds and hundreds of what we call astronomical units, which is just a way of saying um, how far away the Earth is from the sun. So it travels many hundreds of times farther away uh, from us. Um, and this path that it takes, although in this analogy it goes to Vermont and back, it takes about 7,000 years for it to go around in this big uh, elliptical orbit. Um, so uh, to understand, to look at into space, we're seeing things that are so far away, they really boggle our comprehension. The first and closest thing is the moon. Uh, most of us are familiar with that. I've got a, a globe of the moon back here, which I can turn around and see all the different parts of the moon that we can't normally see. Uh, but the moon is obviously quite a bit smaller than the Earth. And a lot of us think it's a lot closer to us than it actually is, but the moon is pretty far away. Um, so here is, again, another example of false representations and, and, uh, and astronomy is not a deliberate one, but we, I often see pictures like this where we have the great big Earth and, and the pretty small moon right next to each other. But actually, the, um, if you guys can see, uh, the moon is really far away. So it's about 30 times the diameter of the Earth away from us, uh, 400,000 kilometers to a quarter million miles, however you want to put it. Uh, most astronauts, including the International Space Station, pretty much every astronaut uh, since the 1970s, 
travels in a tiny, tiny little orbit around the Earth. But the Apollo astronauts 51 uh, years ago traveled all this way out here. It's the farthest journey any human being has ever been on. Um, when we look uh, through binoculars, this is what you might see. And again, I'm going to be emphasizing binoculars in my talk because that's the kind of optical instrument most of us have, uh, but also do a few telescopes. So uh, what you can see when you look at the moon are the different uh, seas, uh, which are lava plains. They're basically giant craters um, that were formed billions of years ago when really, really large asteroids hit the moon. They're darker than the rest of the moon, which is pretty light. Um, through a telescope, you can see a better view and you can see some of the smaller craters in really dramatic detail. Tonight um, is the first quarter moon, so we see about half of the moon in the sky. And I think it's the most beautiful time to look through a telescope because you can see really, really dramatic shading along this part, which is the division between the day and the night on the moon. Uh, in an actual telescope like mine, everything gets turned upside down, but you can uh, still figure things out. It doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, another thing that you can uh, see wonderfully with binoculars, and you can also see with the telescope is the planet Jupiter, much farther away than the moon. Um, so uh, uh, Jupiter has four moons. Um, and if I click the next slide, you can see what their names are. Uh, Io, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. Um, these are all named after different lovers of Jupiter, and we'll talk about one of them in a bit more. Uh, but um, you can see them really easily with a pair of binoculars because they're all in a straight line. You see the planet in the middle and you see those four moons all around it. And they're really fun to watch um, because they move very quickly, honestly. Um, every night you go out and look, you'll see them in a different position, and especially the ones that are very close to Jupiter. Io and Europa move really, really fast. If you have a telescope, sometimes you can see them going in and out of Jupiter's shadow. And you can also, with the telescope, see the bands of clouds on Jupiter. Uh, through uh, binoculars, you won't be able to get too much out of Saturn, but with a small telescope, really small one, an inexpensive one that costs no more than $200, $300, um, or even less <laughs> if, if you can get it uh, used or something like that, you can see the wonderful rings of Saturn. Uh, and you can also see a lot of its moons. Uh, it has too many uh, moons named. The one that you'll most likely see is Titan, which is the biggest one. All these moons of these outer planets are, are really wonderful, exciting places. Most of them are bigger than our moon. Um, including Ganymede, the largest one in the whole solar system. Um, so, and we know nowadays that these are all possible harbors for life too, which makes them very interesting. Uh, moving on pretty quickly, since I have a lot of material, uh, here is what Venus might look like through a telescope. You can't see too much except that um, it has a crescent phase, just like our moon does, because it's closer to the sun than us. Mars, if you, have a, if you have a good telescope and you have a clear night, you can see a lot of detail. Uh, here's an example of what it looks like right now. You can see a large white area called Hellas Basin, which is an enormous crater named after Greece. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about Greece tonight since they are some of the early astronomers. Um, there's two moons of Mars, which are really hard to see, but they're on this uh, planetary program anyway. Uh, because we want to always want to know more about Mars, it's the most Earth-like of all the planets that we know about in our solar system. Uh, uh, a lot of people are exploring it. Um, th this month alone, uh, the United Arab Emirates has sent a probe. This is a Chinese probe called Tianwen, which is on its way to Mars right now. And in a few days, I think on July 30th, the United States is also going to send a probe. It's called Perseverance. And its focus is really going to be to look for signs of, of ancient life, ancient water. Uh, Mars is no longer very uh, habitable or pleasant to live on necessarily compared to the Earth. But in ancient times, it was covered in oceans rivers and all kinds of life-giving uh, environments. So uh, a good place to start with astronomy, um, I'm going to be addressing this to everyone, but uh, where I really start with astronomy is learning the constellations, because uh, the constellations are basically the language of the, of the sky in a way, and they help us find things. So when I talk about um, different constellations like the Big Dipper, it really helps us find things like the comet that just happened to be passing it permanently through it. Um, so uh, constellations are also another uh, area of where you might, what we might uh, cynically call fake news or uh, at least misrepresentations in astronomy. Uh, because in ancient times, people drew these really beautiful elaborate illustrations of constellations. Um, and of course, if you go out in the night sky, you won't see anything like this. You won't see these beautiful painted goats and uh, centaurs and things like that. But um, uh, it, it, knowing, these, knowing these shapes and knowing these stories is really helpful. So. Uh, the constellations are actually random patterns of stars that we make patterns. Um, every culture in the world has its own patterns. I'm going to be talking about just a few of them. Here's an example of how um, in mythology we view Capricorn as a sea goat, a, go a half goat, half fish. Um, but in reality, um, 
it's just an, an agglomeration of stars. <laughs> uh, so how do we go from uh, this, what we see, um, these are the official borders of Capricorn in, in the year uh, 2020, to this. So uh, one thing that we try to do is we try to make stick figures. So here's an example. Um, you connect some of the brightest stars, just like you might do um, in, in a children's book of, of connecting the dots. And there's actually no official way to do this. So and you can use your creativity to try to uh, draw them. And you, and you start from the bright stars that you see, connect dots, and then you see how this stick figure of a goat actually represents the ancient goat that people saw. Um, once you start to do this for enough constellations, your night sky will be very different for you. I, I started doing this through a book called Learn the Constellations by H.A. Ray uh, when I was much younger. Um, and, it, uh, and it really helped me see the night sky in a different way. It used to be a, a terrifying, scary uh, mess of stars. It was very hard to navigate um, intellectually or visually. Um, but once I started to learn these kind of cute uh, cartoon patterns, it really changed how I, I saw everything. Um, uh, one analogy that I've come up with for how to understand the constellations is the idea of Chinese characters, um, because I'm in the process of trying to teach myself Japanese at the moment. I'm trying to do this. Um, often it seems very uh, daunting at first. You have all these strange uh, shapes that you don't, and they all mean a different word. You have to memorize all of them. But they actually evolved over a long time from pictures of things. So here's a picture of a goat. Uh, the first drawings of the goat were much more realistic, and over time they became stylized. Uh, so. Uh, to learn uh, Chinese or Japanese or other language that says that script, often we start with the, the written shape and we try to use our imagination to imagine the original thing and it helps you memorize that. Um, realizing that's not a one for one correspondence, but it's an analogy. Um, so likewise, when I look at the night sky and I see these dots, I start to connect some lines and then I have in my mind a secret. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a, a set of stars tonight, three stars called the Summer Triangle. Um, and here you see it's kind of like a big bright triangle in the sky. I'm going to pause here for a moment and just go into a planetarium program that I have with me um, called Stellarium. And I'm going to show you how to find the summer triangle tonight. So if I uh, go ahead um, a few hours, I have a lot of freedom to, to do that with the program. So I'm going to go ahead two hours or four hours into the night. Uh, you'll be able to find uh, the summer triangle pretty easily if you look towards the south because we'll see two really, really bright stars. Uh, they're actually planets Saturn and Jupiter. Um, and uh, the summer triangle is, this three, is a set of three bright stars above it, Denim, Vega, and Altair. So what I want to try to do and, and the rest of my talk before I take questions is trying to just flesh out how, uh, what, how we see these, how to recognize these constellations, how do we connect that with the stories behind them. Um, so uh, these three constellations are part of my, are some of my favorites because they actually do look with, like, what they're supposed to do. Uh, Deneb is a beautiful swan called Cygnus. Altair is an eagle, and you can see his uh, glamorous outspread wings here flying. And these two birds are gliding along the Milky Way in opposite directions, and they seem to be about ready for head-on collision. Off to the side is a constellation, a small one, uh, called Lyra, Lyra, with this bright star Vega. Vega is one of the brightest stars you'll see when you look straight up overhead. So again, if you have trouble finding these things, look straight overhead around uh, 9 or 10 o'clock. You'll go um, So. Okay. Okay. So here is um, um, okay. Um, I'm having some trouble <laughs> entering the. Um, the slideshow part. So I'll just kind of, if you guys can see this, hopefully, um, give me a thumbs up if you can, Jocelyn. Uh, should be able to, okay, great. <laughs> okay, so here is uh, the constellation Cygnus, um, and it's always been represented as a swan. Um, so Cygnus represents a really ancient myth uh, with a lot of characters. I'm going to try to summarize it really quick of the fall of Phaethon um, and, and his friend Cygnus. Um, so here uh, you see a bas relief from ancient uh, Greece, and Phaethon is this, Phaethon, I think his name is is falling from the sky. Right down here, a little bit hard to see is the swan. Uh, I'm gonna try to make the connection between these two. Uh, so um, uh, let's start with the god Helios. So in ancient Greece, they thought that the sun rose every day uh, because a god named Helios carried it along on a chariot, who, rising up from the ocean, traveling across the vault of the sky and landing again in the evening, carrying the sun back to the other part of the sky. Um, 
So Helios is, is an ancient god. You can see that the sunlight coming out of his head. Uh, he had a son named Phaethon, um, and a lot of people mocked him for saying that he wasn't really the son of the uh, he wasn't really the son of the sun <laughs> uh, because he didn't seem to have uh, you know any of his enormous powers, all, all inspiring ability to give life to the whole world. Um, so he wanted he went to his father to ask how he could get a sign. Uh, that. Uh, his father promised him anything that his heart desired to to prove to the world that he was the son of Helios. And Phaethon decided that he wanted to drive the chariot of the sun for one day. Uh, Helios knew this was a disaster uh, in the making, and he tried everything he could to get him to change his mind, but because he made a promise, he couldn't. So Phaethon took off, and as you might imagine, uh, it, it was very, very difficult for him, not, not ever having done this before. If you've ever been on a roller coaster, you might know that sickening feeling when you go up for the first time and you're way above the, uh, way above the ground. Phaethon had that when his chariots took off into the sky and, and he lost all his sense of bearings. He became terrified at some of the constellations he saw, like the lion and the sea serpent, Hydra. Um, and the sun moved in a zigzag course through the sky, sometimes burning towns, sometimes freezing towns when it was too far away. Um, since uh, it was going to destroy the whole world, Zeus intervened, and with a lightning bolt, uh, he, did, he, he shot Phaethon down from the sky. Here we see Zeus on his eagle, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, Phaethon fell down to earth, and he uh, became uh, he died. He fell into the river and drowned. But uh, he had a very good friend named Cygnus of Liguria, a king, uh, who uh, mourned his death uh, very greatly and would go to try to retrieve his bones from the riverbed. Um, uh, and he spent his entire life until he turned old and gray by this riverside trying to find the body of Phaethon. Um, and uh, as a memorial to that, the gods turned him into his, his white hair became white feathers. Uh, his song of lament became the famous song that a swan allegedly sings before the swan dies. You also see the sisters of Phaethon as, as poplar trees. Um, okay, so obviously uh, uh, it's, a, it's a long and convoluted story, but um, what the ancients did to commemorate it was to decide that one of the constellations was a swan. So this represents Cygnus, the friend of Phaethon, plus possibly other uh, swans in mythology. Um, you can also see a few other constellations here as a lyre that I'll talk about in a bit. Here are a few modern ones called the lizard and the fox that were added on in the 18th century. But the ancient constellations are really the most beautiful ones because they look a bit like what they're supposed to look like. Um, I'm going to just show you how to see the Cygnus constellation um, by going back into the planetarium. Okay. So if you look directly overhead tonight, and uh, I suppose around 9 or 10 or even later, you'll see. Um, a really bright star, Deneb. It won't have a name next to it, <laughs> but uh, uh, it'll be one of the three bright stars of the Summer Triangle. And if you connect some lines, you might be able to see that there is something that looks a bit like a cross. Um, and if you use your imagination even more, you can see the broad outswept wings of the swan. Um, and one thing I'd recommend is uh, for folks out there who are interested in trying to learn the constellations, find a program like this. Uh, this is what's called a stellarium. And you can try to just turn the constellation maps on and off, on and off, until you are able to see these uh, imaginary lines just with your imagination without having to see the lines drawn there. And then hopefully when you go out, you can also see those lines that you paint with your own eyes on the night sky, which doesn't have any labels for us. But these stars of Cygnus are particularly bright, much brighter than the stars around it. And it's traveling right across the Milky Way. Um, so you might see uh, on the screen a dark rift in the Milky Way. I'll just briefly say the Milky Way is the galaxy we live in, a huge spiral, uh, and hundreds of thousands of light years across. Uh, this rift is a, is a rift of dust called the Cygnus Rift, and it's one of the enormous, most enormous structures that you can see with the naked eye. Uh, let's take a look at one of its neighbors. This is the constellation of the Lyre. I'll be talking about this. So I'm going to go back to you. Um, okay, so uh, the lyre you see off to the right, um, that represents the harp. Um, so uh, we, we don't usually use lyres much anymore. <laughs> we, they've been replaced by guitars and harps and other instruments. But the lyre is one of the most ancient uh, instruments that we know of. Um, in Greek mythology, it's particularly associated with the god Apollo and also with the demigod Orpheus, you see right here. Uh, he was a, a born of a um, a mortal mother and a, and a, and a godfather, um, so like many of the Greek heroes, and 
Uh, he was so talented at playing uh, music that he was able to charm anyone who would listen to him. Here are all the uh, animals uh, gathering around him. Um, and one day his wife, Eurydice, was bit by a snake. Um, and he was so mournful that he decided to enter the underworld himself in a mission to bring her back. Through the power of his music, he was able to charm the, the, the fearsome uh, monsters that divide the underworld from the upper world. And he was actually able to convince the god of death, Hades, uh, to allow his wife back onto Earth again. First person ever in history to do this. Uh, he had one condition, which was that he was never allowed to look back at his wife on the way back to the other world. Um, and you can imagine that um, that was very difficult for him to do. And he failed. He, he looked back at her when he heard her make a little shout. And um, in that moment, his wife was doomed to return back to the other world. And try as he could to save her, he couldn't. So it's a very tragic story, um, but it's represented, his uh, harp is represented in the night sky um, right here. Um, this is an ancient Babylonian harp. Uh, so uh, this is H.A. Ray's drawing. You might be able to make out a harp. Um, just these two stars here being the strings. Um, but there's another legend about this uh, constellation, which is that it's a vulture, uh, which is kind of hard to reconcile the two things. Sometimes in ancient drawings, they would draw both of them together. So here is the vulture with a guitar. It seems to be a kind of a, a metaphor for the, the perils of the rock and roll lifestyle right here. The, the vulture is falling, right? Um, to see a vulture, it might be a little bit easier than to see a harp. Here is an ancient Egyptian uh, vulture on the left. And here is the constellation that we actually see in the night sky. Um, when you try to look for it, it's basically one very bright star in a triangle, and then a very perfect parallelogram on the other side. That's the whole constellation of wire. Um, so the brightest star is called Vega, and it's a very distinctly blue star, um, about 25 light years away, um, which I think is about how long ago the movie Contact came out with Jodie Foster, uh, where she actually travels to Vega and meets the aliens who live there. So uh, if there are any aliens at Vega, they are maybe able to see this movie for the first time. They might be a bit uh, amused by how we think they look. Uh, moving on very quickly to the constellation of Quilla. Uh, this is another amazing constellation that's part of that summer triangle. And here you can see the outstretched wings and the, the mighty beak of the eagle flying through the Milky Way. Uh, again, with your own naked eye, you're not very likely to see all this in, uh, beautiful structure of the Milky Way unless you're in a very, very dark location. But it's there and you can uh, take photographs. The eagle represents uh, the god Zeus. Um, so it, the king of all the gods and the, the eagle is the king of birds, uh, so that makes sense. Um, uh, Zeus had a reputation for traveling towards earth in the guise of various animals to, to seduce people he took a fancy to. And uh, one of them was the god, uh, the prince Ganymede of Troy, who he uh, brought with him back to the uh, heavens. Um, and uh, Ganymede became the cupbearer for the gods who would bring the mortal. He would bring the gods the nectar and ambrosia that made them immortal. Uh, so a very important role. Um, you can see um, in, in ancient depictions or in, in more not so ancient depictions of this constellation, you usually see him carrying Ganymede off to the night sky. Um, with an unusual thing that the uh, figure of Ganymede is actually called Antinous. So uh, Antinous was a real person uh, who lived um, in the uh, second century AD, and he was the lover of the Emperor Hadrian, um, and he died tragically and mysteriously in the year 130 or thereabouts in the Nile River. Um, and the emperor was so distraught that he uh, made Antinous into a god and commanded the people in his empire to worship him. <laughs> um, and because he was the emperor, he had the power to do that. He also made one of the constellations into Antinous, um, and that constellation lived on for about 2,000 years, uh, as part of the night sky um, until 1930-ish when the International Astronomical Union decided to get rid of this constellation for reasons best known only to them. They also got rid of a few other constellations uh, like the bowl of Poniatowski who commemorates a, a Polish king. Um, uh, so now we officially only have 88 constellations um, uh, so it makes it a little bit easier for us to learn but there are uh, constellations again human inventions that we put on the night sky and for our pursuit of imagination. So you can make any constellation you want. If you see a pattern in the night sky that you find particularly uh, beautiful. Uh, this bright star Altair is one of the closest stars to Earth. It's only 16 light years away. And because it's so close, we actually have images of it um, maybe uh, a little bit, uh, images might be the wrong word, but we were able to reconstruct what it looks like. And it's actually a very uh, strangely squat star because it rotates so fast 
that it's a bulger's, uh, that it's a crater's bulging out. Um, and um, it's uh, actually spinning so fast it's in danger of collapsing if it was, uh, or uh, flying apart. If it was spinning any faster, it might just fly into pieces. Um, so um, let's go to Perseid. So I'm gonna talk about one more thing before I start taking your questions and showing you the planetarium of whatever you wanna see. Uh, so the Perseids are a meteor shower that happen every August. And this year they're gonna happen around August 11th, 12th, and um, 13th, I think. Um, you don't have to go out in any uh, special time, but usually earlier in the morning is better. Um, and I'll just try to explain one thing I find really fascinating about meteor showers. If you uh, go out to say the beach and you look up on, you, you'll see lots of meteors, you'll see them in every part of the sky, you don't have to look in any particular direction. But if you were to take a long exposure photograph like this one, and trace back where all the meteors came from. They all come from a similar direction. And what I love about meteor showers is that they are really one of the only ways that we can get a sense of how fast we're traveling. Remember I talked at the beginning about how the Earth is moving in this enormous path around the sun in just one year, uh, which translates to 30 kilometers every second, 20 miles every second. We're going enormously fast. We don't have any sense of it because unlike uh, we're, we're also all traveling at the same speed. And um, since the time of Galileo, we've known that we only feel changes in speed, we don't feel the actual speed we're traveling at. If you're traveling really fast on Earth, in a car, for instance, or in a boat, you feel uh, the wind in your hair, you feel all kinds of jostles as, as you move along that bumpy road. Um, the only time that we on Earth ever get a sense of how fast we're traveling is when we see a meteor. Uh, because if you've ever seen a meteor, and chances are most of us have, they, they can happen any, any night of the year, they move really, really fast. So they're typically traveling around 60 kilometers a second when they hit our atmosphere. Uh, we're seeing them pretty far away, um, but they, they travel much, 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 much faster than any bullet or spacecraft or anything else that uh, we've ever come across. And they are just basically, um, uh, when we looked at the, for instance, uh, let me go right back to the beginning. Uh, when we looked at the comet, Neowise, we see this huge tail of dust and other particles coming out of it. Um, once the comet has moved on, that dust can still remain in its orbit. And when the Earth collides with that dust, uh, we get these beautiful meteor showers that happen every so often, around the same time each year. Um, OK, so that's about all I wanted to share with you that uh, came to my mind. But I would love to take questions from anyone in the audience. And again, I have a planetarium program with me that I can use and just you can talk about anything that you're interested in. William, um, there are a couple questions already. Um, the first is, um, how big is Neowise? Okay, so Neowise um, is about, uh, I think I read it was about three kilometers across. I think that averages out to two miles. Um, so it's, it's small. Um, if you uh, think about uh, the town that you live in, Shelter Island is probably about the same size as that. <laughs> that gives you a sense of, of, of how big it is. It's not, uh, it's not enormous as, as things in the solar system go, but it has such a huge tail, which is much, much bigger than the sun, much, much bigger than um, anything else in the solar system. And that tail is, is just composed of tiny little bits of dust that have been blown off of it. So when you talk about how big Neowise is, you either refer to the nucleus, which is a really small rock traveling through space, or you can refer to the tail, which is enormous, absolutely enormous, bigger than uh, tens of thousands of times the size of the Earth. It's pretty incredible to think about. Um, how about where to look for planets from the east end? Where are some good spots to view them? Um, okay, so um, I recommend, uh, personally, I, I go to the beach. We have a lot of beaches around here. Um, I live on the South Fork, so I like to go to the ocean or the Bayside, whatever your preference is. Um, I know that a lot of folks here might be listening from Shelter Island. So when I'm on Shelter Island, uh, some of my favorite places are Wade's Beach or, or Ram Island. Um, places where you get away from light pollution, which is the biggest issue. Um, and um, I'll explain briefly what that is. It's basically just lights from cities, lights from houses, lights from um, uh, civilization in all of its ways. Let me show you what the planets might look like tonight so you can, can find them more easily. Uh, here, uh, here we are at 1040 tonight. Uh, you'll see the moon uh, towards the southwest about to set. You'll see Sagittarius to the south, which is this cute constellation looks just like a, a teapot, even though it's supposed to be uh, an archer. Um, and then next to it, you'll find Saturn and Jupiter. Um, so those are in the south right now, and they're easy to find because Jupiter is much, much brighter than any star in the sky. You see something really bright, and you see something less bright to the left of it, you know you're seeing Jupiter and Saturn. Um, if you want to see the other planets, you'll have to wait a little while until the morning hours. So 
let me show you. Um, as the night goes on, the planets all kind of drift towards the west. Um, and then if we wait until, let's see what time this is, 3.40, so we're an early riser, you'll see Mars and Venus, which will be rising in the east. Mars is uh, pretty bright already in the constellation Pisces, and it's getting brighter and brighter as it moves closer towards Earth. Venus is always bright, um, and it's particularly bright right now, but you can only see it right uh, an hour or so before dawn. Um, and that's in the constellation of the bull, Taurus, pretty close to the Pleiades, which is a really beautiful star cluster. So you can see all those things if, if you look towards the east of the moon. Um, William, I'm going to unmute Anya, and okay. she has a question. Okay. Um, for about the past month or so, um, I've been outside because I walk my dog late at night, around 11 or 12 o'clock, and I looked up in the sky, and what I see is I see a star, mm -hmm. and I see another star sort of next to it, and all of a sudden, the other star starts making like triangles. It goes zip, 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 zip. It's moving, and I've, I've seen this 30 nights in a row. It's not like I just happened to see something weird and it never happened again, but it moves. And I, you know, I have, obviously I'm very, very curious about it. Is, mm -hmm. is that, do you know about that? Or maybe it's a constellation. I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, um, so I'll, I'll try to wager a guess. I, I haven't seen it myself. Um, okay. But um, one thing I'll say is that um, if you are seeing something really bright, mm -hmm. um, you might want to just see if it might be this planet Jupiter. Um, because um, Jupiter and Saturn are, are right next to each other. Now, um, Jupiter and Saturn don't move particularly fast. They move very slowly uh, through the hours. So it's not likely that you'll be seeing them zip, zip, zip like that. But mm -hmm. I know that for myself, sometimes if something is close to a, a tree on the horizon, sometimes Repeat eventually... what you're saying. Oh, can what? you hear me? I can hear you. Can okay. you start again? Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, so one thing, I mean, there are, there are a few possibilities. When you see something moving in the night sky, um, the most common uh, thing is uh, an airplane. There's a lot of them out there. Another yeah. common type of thing is a satellite, uh, right. of which there are more and more every year. And those orbit around the Earth, and they tend to move in a very, very straight, uh, straight path. They look just like stars. Uh, some of them can be really bright, but they don't tend to zigzag, like you said. Yeah. So again, I, I can't necessarily identify what you're seeing because I haven't seen it with my own eyes. Um, um, you can come to my house tonight and see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure if I can come tonight, but uh, if you uh, if you uh, tell me uh, what town you're in, you don't have to tell me where you live exactly. I can Shelter see. Island. Shelter Island. Okay, so yeah, I'm not on Shelter Island, but it's uh, it, I would um, I would try to get a picture of it. If you have an app, I will. I'll mention one called Nightcap. If you have an iPhone or something like that, you can actually make some pretty good recordings of the night sky, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of things in the night sky are too faint to see. Um, but if you use if you use a certain kind of uh, certain apps that are designed for the photographing things at night, you can make little videos and recordings of what you're seeing in the night sky. So that might that might help me get a sense of what you're looking at. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, this goes on every blessed night, and I oh, wonderful. You know, exciting. I go out, can't wait to see it. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. I, I'll give you my own story of something mysterious I saw, which was about a year ago, uh, almost a year ago, exactly. Uh, in July of last year, I saw an extremely bright object in the night sky, much brighter than any I had ever seen. Uh, and I was very confused because I thought it was the moon for a minute. And I also knew that the moon wasn't out that night. So I wasn't sure what was going on. Uh, I looked out of my car. I happened to be driving and I saw this enormous explosion in the sky. It was oh. bright blue. Uh, almost like uh, missiles shooting overhead. I was actually terrified because I didn't know what was going on. I thought maybe something exploded. Right. Uh, it turned out something did explode. It was a meteor that was much brighter than any meteor I'd ever seen in my entire life. Oh. Um, and uh, it was actually seen by hundreds of people up and down the East Coast. A lot of people caught it on camera. Those are the kinds of mysterious things that you never know when are going to happen. And you, you just kind of kind of go out there and, and right. make notes and try to describe maybe if, again, uh, when folks begin to learn the constellations, we just know what direction, they, they can kind of say, okay, this was in this part of the sky, and I saw it at this time, and people can compare notes and, and share things that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Um, William, mm -hmm. um, it's, I hope I'm reading this right. Can you pop the moon into that picture for about 930? Does that yeah. make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, so let me just um, move this. Okay, so I'm going to uh, change the hour. Um, so let's see here. Okay, so this looks to be about 9.45. It's probably close enough. 
So you can see the moon uh, here in the southwest. Let's zoom in on it. Uh, you can see that it's a, what we call the first quarter moon. You see about half of the moon. Um, and um, yeah, one thing I'll say about the moon tonight is that it's very close to a star with a fun name. So this is a star called Zub Zubin el Janubi. Um, and it's part of the constellation of Libra, which is pretty faint. You might not be able to see any of these other stars, but you can see Zubin el Janubi. You can see Zubin el Shamali. Uh, they, they're the pair of stars in the night sky. If you zoom in on Zubin el Janubi uh, with a pair of binoculars, you don't need much. You can see it's actually two different stars very close to each other, a double star. That's fun to see. Uh, any other questions? Anyone have any questions? This has been fascinating. Uh, let's um, let me um, stop the screen share. I know that there are a lot of questions in the chat, so um, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, if anyone wants to be unmuted, but I can unmute you. That was a lot of, that was so much material just to absorb. It's amazing your, no, your knowledge. Well, um, one, one question here is from Charlotte, uh, which is, uh, what is a good telescope to buy? Um, so uh, that's a question people ask me a lot. Um, so uh, as part of the Solar System Ambassador Program, I'm not allowed to make specific brand recommendations, but I can tell you a type of telescope that I like, and it's called a Dobsonian, a Dobsonian telescope. Um, this is a type of telescope that was invented by a person named Dobson uh, back in the 1970s. And it's, uh, it's just a very simple type of telescope because it doesn't have a fancy mount. It doesn't track the stars as the stars move across the night sky. It doesn't require a motor. It doesn't require a computer. It's built like a cannon. And it basically has a large mirror on the back that you look through the front of it. Um, and um, there are a lot of uh, companies that make Dobsonian telescopes. One thing that's great about them is that they are cheap. Uh, relatively speaking to other telescopes, and they are powerful. So you can see really faint things, and you can also see detailed things like the ring of Saturn and Jupiter. So that's the first kind of telescope I ever bought. That's the only kind of telescope I, I tend to have used since then. Um, so another question is, uh, how do you find M101? Uh, uh, so M101 is referring to Messier 101. Um, so there was a, a French astronomer named Charles Messier, um, who, who uh, cataloged just hundreds of different, or about a hundred different galaxies in the night sky. Um, I'm going to bring up the planetarium program again, and we will try to find M101. I believe it's in the Big Dipper, but I sometimes forget where it is. All right. So let's see. So if I remember correctly, um, this is M101. M101. Okay, I did get it. <laughs> so we also, call, we also called it Pinwheel Galaxy. Let me explain how, how to find it first and then what it is. So uh, if you, a lot of everyone, most people can recognize the Big Dipper. It's the most recognizable constellation in the night sky. Let's say you have a telescope of, of any kind. Uh, you might start from this star here, which is called Mizar, uh, which is a double star. A lot of people can see it has a, as a companion star called Alcor. And the Arabic is called the, uh, the, the horse and the rider. Um, if you follow the stars in the direction, they, they start to follow a little line that you can follow with a telescope or a pair of binoculars, and they lead you to a faint fuzzy spot right over here. Now, uh, through a pair of binoculars, you might not see anything more than a little smudge. Uh, through a telescope, you, you might see a little bit more detail. Probably won't see something as detailed as this unless you have a really, really good telescope, but this isn't what it looks like through, say, the Hubble telescope or some other really big research telescope. It's a really uh, amazing spiral galaxy um, that um, has all these different arms coming off of it, just like, and just like the Milky Way that we live in. We live in the middle of one of these types of things. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of light years across. They have uh, over 100 billion stars, usually. Um, so hopefully that explains uh, what, M10, what M101, I can't say, what M101 is and also how to find it. Um, I also recommend uh, folks who are, are just getting into astronomy for the first time to uh, try to uh, get an app. I'm not going to recommend a particular one because there's so many of them, but an app on your phone that explains uh, where things are in the night sky tonight. 
Um, it's very helpful. It, I use them all the time to try to find uh, hard to find objects like galaxies and globular clusters and things like that. I'm sorry, what'd you say, Justin? I couldn't quite hear you. Maybe uh, you're muted for the moment. I always do that. What no is this, every time, what is the Solar System Ambassador? What do you do in that role? So Solar System Ambassador uh, program, again, is an educational program. Uh, so we do events. We've done lots of different events. Um, in the past, we've gone to science fairs and we've gone to, um, um, uh, basically, basically, we hold public events, similar to what the Hamptons Observatory uh, does, um, in my other role. Um, and we, uh, we just try to uh, bring the nice guy to people. So the ambassador role is uh, from, the, from the universe to the average person just trying to explain what's going on in the night sky or give people a heads up about something interesting that might happen. Um, uh, so the first, uh, when I first started doing this, the, the first thing we ever did is I took a bunch of people to the beach and we watched a rocket launch uh, that was happening in Virginia, but you could still see it from the beach in Amagansa. It was pretty incredible. Um, and since then, we've done different kinds of programs about um, rocket launches that have happened or um, just cool celestial events, uh, which we usually see. Uh, one question from Julia is about the Whirlpool Galaxy, I think, right? So let me um, let me go back to uh, the screen share again and the planetarium. Um, okay, so I'm going to zoom out a bit just to give you. Um, so the Whirlpool Galaxy is another uh, of those Messier galaxies, um, and it's in this direction, in the same direction as the Big Dipper. But instead of going on top of the handle, we're going to go under the handle, and we're going to zoom in. Uh, this is the last star called Al Qaeda. Uh, near it is another bright star, which I don't remember the name of, 24 CBN, kind of spinatacy, not that interesting. But if we look, if we make a little triangle with our eyes from this star to this star to over here, another isosceles, we see that there's another fuzzy spot. We zoom in on it, and we see another beautiful galaxy. This is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, it's my favorite galaxy, actually, in the night sky, just because uh, of all the things I've seen through my telescope, this is the one that looks most like what it's supposed to. You, you actually can see a lot of the spiral structure even with a small telescope. Um, it's uh, one a huge galaxy colliding with a much smaller galaxy. So that kind of exaggerates the, the beautiful spiral shape of it. And uh, it was also the first galaxy that anyone uh, ever was able to recognize as a spiral shape. That was back in the early 1800s, an Irish astronomer, the world's largest telescope, was able to see the spiral shape for the first time. Uh, one thing that's kind of cool about this picture is if you look in the background, there's a, another galaxy right here, probably 10 times farther away or even more, which is on, we're looking edge on. Um, so whenever you take a picture of a galaxy through a really powerful telescope, you always see other galaxies in the background. There's just countless of them, countless billions that we've <laughs> found so far. I'm afraid you're on mute again, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, unmute yourself. <laughs> oh. Um, looks like, and I don't see any any other questions. Um, so I think we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, at, but William, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's fascinating, and thank you, Donna McCormick from Hamptons Observatory. Um, really appreciate it. And we'll we'll have this on YouTube. Um, I don't know within a week or so. So if if you know anyone that didn't get to go, they can check and thank you so much up. and uh, one thing i'll just say is that if, if you go to the website of hamptons observatory uh, org um you can um you can uh, find emails for all of us and you can ask any questions that maybe i didn't get a chance to answer today and also find out about other programs that we're planning to do uh, as well. oh that's great thank you so much and um, so just that's it good good night everyone Go out Thank and watch, so look for some stars, look for some planets. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, go out, uh, look for the comet if you can tonight in the north. Um, and just keep your eyes open for meteors. We're already starting to get a lot of them, so they're really fun to see. Great. Thanks again. Thanks again, Thank William. So Bye. Okay, so Good night, all. Thank you.